actually really good. Um, and I found that there's another method called cast. Um, cast does the exact same thing that convert does, but it has a different signature. Now it's cast value or expression as data type, no columns. I used that, it worked. It gives the exact same, uh, it gives the exact same error message. And that's why I realized that it's not, uh, not the function. The, the old convert attack has nothing to do with the word convert. It's the conversions, it's the library itself that does it. And um, so I, then I started doing implicit conversions, which is where the database does conversions for you. Um, and so I figured that you didn't even have to use words like convert um, or cast. You can do much more subtle things. Um, you can throw stuff directly into queries. Um, you, can, uh, you can take things that would return NVAR cars and try and do mathematical operations on them. Um, or just take NVAR cars, and if the field is, uh, is typed as like an int, it will try to implicitly convert to an int, and all of those will fail and give you the, the error messages back. Um, at Black Hat, I, I got to speak to a guy at MS about this, and he was actually all over it. And there's, there's a trace flag you can set that's supposed to suppress the, the schema leakage in these messages. Um, I, I'm going to talk with him about trying to get that pushed by default because I consider this stuff to be debugging information. Um, I don't think this is something that needs to be turned on by default. I think this is something you turn on as you're building an application to figure out why your queries are building. Um, but the trace flag is 3625. You can throw it in your SQL that exe line statement when you start the server, or you can execute it at runtime. When you execute at runtime, you have to follow the, uh, the trace flag with a negative one to set it globally, otherwise it's just session based. Um, all right, more fun with SQL injection. Now it gets funner. But this is all fun, right? Yeah, I'm so sad. Um, <laughs> more SQL injection. I have 15 minutes, and uh, I'm telling you now, I'm going long. Um, Select statements, um, remember, SQL injection, arbitrary database commands. Select statements for learning and learning how to form the queries and do this stuff. Um, in the wild, certainly you do selects, but people do a lot more than selects. Select is part of CRUD, change, remove, update, delete. Um, it, it's, it's a minuscule portion of what you do in the SQL language. It, it's really a very small amount of what you do in the language. Um, a good DBA can build the database, manage the database, admin the database, and eventually kill the database all from T-SQL statements, right? Um, and so can a good attacker. Um, you can do things like shut down the database, right? Um, this is new. There's no quotes, there's no union, there's no select, because it's not a query, it's a command, right? So you can shut down the database without any of the things that your newfangled IDS might be looking at. Um, you can drop the database. When you drop the database, it deletes the devices from the file system. Um, you can enumerate who you're logged in as. Now, the bad part about this is to do this, you have to be SA. Um, but if you are SA, it's real easy to tell. Um, you can add your own logins if you're SA. You can port scan. This is a cool technique. Um, you can do... <laughs> so, right. So now there's two different ways you can port scan uh, from internal networks. One is SQL injection. One is the... Uh, um, the uh, uh, visited uh, the, the Ajax hacking stuff. Um, uh, you open a rec there, there's a there's a command called open open record set open row set which tells database A that as part of its plan to execute the query it needs to talk to database D B. When you do that, you have to give it a connection string to database B. Um, I give it a connection string. I tell it that database B lives on Yahoo.com on port 80, which is an open port, right? At least five nines. We still get a network error message. That's okay. We get a network error message because ODBC error messages are painfully cryptic, but that's all right. We tell it to connect to a database on a closed port and we get a different error message. So we have one error message when the port's open or one response when the port's open, a different response when the port's closed. You script that and you're port scanning, right? You increment the ports, you change the IPs, and you're port scanning from the database. Not from you, not from the website, scanning from the back-end database behind four pairs of, of firewalls and IDSs. Why four pairs when there's only two layers? You have to have two devices. You have to have failover and HSRP and VERP and stuff like that. Why? Twice the commission. Um, <laughs> I have not signed the release for the video. Um, uh, some neat things, you can, you, can, uh, you can get a sys objects and query for name values. Um, and 
card operators uh, to restrict them to certain things. So you can do select name from sys objects, where name is like reg. The percent is a wild card in, in SQL. And, um, and sure enough, 30 different stored procedures and extended stored procedures that do registry operations. Someone was asking me earlier on the balcony, um, I'm interested in, in the rooting stuff, going beyond the table, like getting into the box and going back on from that, right? Well, this is definitely one way you can do it. You can get inside the registry. Here's stuff that deals with logins. Um, change user logins, add remote login. Get MS login mappings and see which Active Directory logins are, are mapped to which SQL logins. Um, um, get is valid Windows login from distributor. <laughs> um, drop link server logins. And there's actually a lot of stuff that interacts. Um, these are just a, a couple examples. But I mean, you go through and start reading, um, start looking through sysobjects yourself and just scrolling and selecting things, reading books online. There's a lot of interaction with, with the operating system with the, and with Active Directory um, available to you. And, um, and I'm sure it's the same case with Oracle and DBU, uh, DB2, because these are all you know, high-end enterprise databases, and they need those sort of capabilities in there for the enterprise management stuff. Um, input validation, again, is not a fix for SQL injection, but it's, it's a thing to have. Um, Rummy had some awesome advice on input validation. Uh, I got to use this slide inside the Pentagon. <laughs> It rocked, and they laughed, too. Um, uh, he said, there are things you know, there are things you don't know, and then there's things you don't even know you don't know. Um, I said it shorter, but the same thing. Um, so what he's basically talking about is blacklisting versus whitelisting. Now, I think he's talking about different stuff, but it pertains to blacklisting versus whitelisting. Um, a lot of stuff out there actually blacklists. A lot of proxies blacklist. A lot of devices blacklist. They may not necessarily do it properly. They might be using literals instead of regexes. Their regexes might not be anchored properly. Regexes are tough to build right. Um, uh, at SPY, we do a lot of regexes. Um, they can be painful. And when you mess them up, it's, it's uh, uh, painful. Um, one way, uh, I, I did a site once where I, based on the error messages, I could tell that they're stripping out the words union and the words select. When you blacklist, you have a decision to make. Do I remove the unwanted characters or phrases? Do I escape them, or do I reject the request altogether? I prefer rejecting the request altogether. Here I could tell they were simply removing. So what I did is I wrapped union inside union. Duh. Um, uh, last time we did it was, Billy, this was with John, and uh, I found this. Um, it was a proxy. Something was breaking like union select, but it was looking for union select, not union and or select. So we did the union select with a comment in between and we just closed our comment between the union and select. It broke the pattern. It went through. Um, <clears throat> whitelisting, uh, right, regular expressions. Everyone says regular expressions. If you have a wide open uh, uh, format, you're kind of stuck blacklisting. A relatively closed format, you have to accept regexes are really good. Um, if you're accepting input from, thanks, if you're accepting input from like selects and radio buttons and checkboxes, right, don't use regexes. Use switches and select case, right? If you know what the values of the input are supposed to be, check against a list of the known values. If you built a bunch of checkboxes here and the checkbox values are A, B, C, D, E, right? Or well, Ford, um, Pontiac, right? Do a switch against Ford and Pontiac. Um, don't bother trying to come up with a regex that matches those. You won't. Um, don't bother trying to cast them to things. They're strings. Um, one of the best things you can do as, as, a, as a validator is trimming the length. Not enough people do that. Um, in the examples I showed on the little bank website, the error code was one, one integer. Values one through eight, exactly one character wide, but yet I was able to put in any length I wanted, right? That's a very real situation on many, many web applications. Um, no one trims the length, it seems. And there's a lot of easy ways to figure out how long the length should be. First of all, you always have that database column, right? Because I'm talking about SQL injection now, so I don't have to worry about scripts and stuff like that. When it comes to validating input into your queries, right, that input can be no longer than the database is, right? You can't put 51 characters into a default 50 character NVAR car column. It doesn't work. You'll get a message that says data would be truncated. I'm not going to put it in. So 
easy way. You can also look at your HTML field widths, right? If the interface is only supposed to accept 10 characters, but you got 20 back instead, someone's not using the interface. Um, if, you, if you suppress error messages without fixing the problem, then you get what's called blind uh, SQL injection. Um, here's, uh, I, took, I took the same page, I changed the HTML a little bit. I'm lazy, I should have changed the colors, really different, but um, I put the single quote in there, it doesn't work. And, uh, and that's because I, I threw in an, uh, an on-air resume next. And then I made it even trickier. Now I don't even write record sets back to the screen, right? Now all I do is I run the query, and if something is returned from the query, I write the words in stock, but I don't write the value that was returned to the query, right? So it's a tough challenge. Um, what you can test in these cases, right, is using this technique. This is only one technique. Blind SQL injection in view in involves a lot of human deduction. The, the techniques can be timing-based, they can be port-based, socket-based, file-based. This is only one technique, but the paradigm is the same. You try and create some sort of Boolean logic in the application, a true-false, a yes-no, that you can use to deduce things. You can do that in this case by using an AND clause. The product type equals one and one equals zero. Now, one does not equal zero. In about four and a half hours, it's going to. But right now, one does not equal zero, so it doesn't return anything back, right? We don't get the words in stock. Um, now, the question here, though, is why don't we get the words in stock back? Is it because the application looked at this and said, wait a minute, you're putting too much in there, I don't like it? Or is the application still letting it go through, but now the database sees it and says, one equals zero, that doesn't work, I have nothing to give you? You don't know that, but you can put a true clause in there and make it say one equals one, right? <clears throat> and this time we get the words in stock. So that tells us that wasn't the application filtering out because if it were, the application would have filtered this as well. Now we know that the application still sends it to the database, but now that makes sense, we get results back. Either way, we have a Boolean logic we can use. We can use this switch to start guessing at table names, right? Until we have a table name we like. Then we can use it to guess at column names. Um, but you can only guess at one letter at a time. You don't want to guess really long words like bank logins because you'll be guessing forever. You want to guess like A, B, C, D. You can use the substring command for that. Substring is just like substring in other languages. You, tell, you give it a string or an expression. You tell it where to start and how many characters to return. So you do a substring of your expression, right? And you return one character and you stick that into the clause. So now you say, is the product type two and the first character of select top access objects is greater than the letter M, and it says no. If it's not greater than the letter M, it must be less than the letter M, right? So you bracket again, and eventually you, you arrive at the first letter of the first table name in sys objects. <coughs> and from there, you just increment your substring to get the second character, the third character, the fourth character, and you get the entire table name. Then you go back and you start at the first character again and you increment your select statement. Right? Select top one name from sys objects where x type equals u and one equals one and name is greater than the one you just gave me. And that gets you uh, all the information. So I have five minutes left. This is gonna be fast. Um, SQL injection is caused by concatenation, not, <laughs> not input validation. Um, the way you fix it is parameterized queries, not stored procedures. You can, you can concatenate variables into stored procedures when you call them, and you can mess up your stored procedures on the database. The use of stored procedures by itself 